Hi everyone, I'm Kyle Dyer and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this Friday, April 7th. We have had a big week in Colorado with municipal elections in the state's two largest cities, Denver and Colorado Springs, and state lawmakers are facing just four weeks left in the legislative session, during which close to 600 items have been introduced. For some insight and reaction, let me introduce you to tonight's panel, which includes Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward, Krista Kafer, columnist for the Denver Post, Eric Sonderman, columnist for Colorado Politics and the Denver and Colorado Springs Gazettes, and we also have tonight Amber McReynolds, former director of elections for the city and county of Denver and a leading expert on election administration and policy throughout the country and beyond, really. So it's great to have you here. Thank you. Let's start with the results from this week's elections. Patty, once again, we're seeing that every single vote matters. Well, especially since right now the count isn't final, but it looks like we are going to have a runoff for sure between Mike Johnston and Kelly Bruff. But you also see how the, ele the individual voter voters did pull through for so many of those other candidates. They showed they wanted change. You had Lisa Calderon pulling very quickly, close, closer and closer to Kelly. You had Andy Rougeau, who was a big surprise. He definitely outpolled just the Republican um, party in this in Denver. He was doing well. His his message definitely resonated with people. So even though only two of the 16 are moving on to the runoff, you see that people were listening to their individual messages and did vote for changes in this city. So now we just have to figure out exactly which changes they were voting for and which mayoral candidate will give them to us. What were your thoughts after? I guess this whole week has been talk of election, not just Tuesday. You know, I was relieved. I don't live in Denver, but you know, I was born and raised in, in the, the metro area, and I was very relieved for Denver that did not end up with a far left candidate. I think Johnston or Bruff will be a fine mayor. Um, just driving in today and just seeing endless homeless camps and vagrants and, uh, you know, we've got a crime issue. I'm really glad that some, some folks with some solid ideas versus the sort of other side, which is, hey, let's, you know, let, let, let's, let's go easy on crime. Let's go easy on vagrancy. Let's let this, uh, this wound continue to fester. Instead, I think either Bruff or Johnston will be able to say, hey, we really need to take some common sense policies and clean up Denver. I remember Denver you know, back in the 70s and 80s when you just didn't go downtown. Like, you could go to the Magic Pan, right, on Larimer Street. That was it. Patty remembers For the Magic crepes, Pan. For crepes, right? For crepes. <laughs> but that was it. Then you got the heck out of there. Um, and then under the Hickenlooper administration, it became this really fantastic city. And I'd like to bring that safety and, and safe, clean, good city back in. Everybody does, right? Eric? There's no argument about, th no argument about that. I think you know, the election certainly moved from where we thought it was Tuesday night to where it is, uh, you know, a good number of hours and days later in terms of in terms of the results. I don't think the bottom line has changed. We're talking about Mike Johnston and Kelly Bruff in a runoff, but uh, those day of election voters clearly were more progressive-minded voters, and that's why Lisa Calderon's count has gone up. Sarah Parity has apparently eclipsed our friend around this table, Penfield Tate. Candy C. DeBacca still faces a runoff, but maybe she'll do it from the number one position instead of the number two position, et cetera. In terms of what the voters were saying, I'm largely with Patty and with Krista here. I think the voters recognize that this is a city in crisis, and they were picking sober-minded, serious, centrist candidates. They didn't want ideologues either of the right or of the left. You know, for the first time in memory, we don't really have a curveball in this election. These are two candidates who are both pillars of the civic establishment, and we also don't, for the first time in more than 40 years, maybe 45, don't have a minority face in that runoff. But there is in Colorado Springs, we'll right? We'll get there. Uh, in conservative Colorado Springs, Yemi Mobilati, who is considered progressive, is the front runner going into the runoff next month versus Wayne Williams, who's on the city council Republican there. That's a, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch as to how he is at the top. Um, speaking of the Springs, Amber, uh, their runoff in Colorado Springs is May 15th. Mm -hmm. Our runoff in Denver is June the 4th. Why do we wait so long in Denver to vote? Well, this has actually been a change that Denver actually just went through within the last few years. Uh, we used to have a May, the first part of a May uh, initial election with a runoff in June. Um, and what uh, 
the city council referred to the ballot was a change to allow more time in between the elections to accommodate military and overseas voters to get their ballots. Colorado Springs has not made that same adjustment on the calendar, so they have a much more compressed timeline. Um, and frankly, they should consider a change, whether it be consolidating the elections and using ranked choice voting or something, because they are uh, at risk at leaving a lot of their military voters out by this compressed timeline that doesn't allow m much time for ballots to get back in. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And even though, we, you know, we are taping the show before perhaps the final, final, final votes are, sure. are counted, you're thinking just from your experience where they stand come Thursday are pretty much going to be the final results? I don't anticipate those percentages changing, but I will point out that we always talk about kind of the candidate names, but we also have to talk about what the candidates represent in Denver. And right now, it looks like about 45% of voters chose Kelly or, or Mike. So that percentage is about what um, will make the runoff. That means about 55% of Denver did not vote for someone that's gonna be on the runoff ballot. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different ideas about solving problems within Denver, and it'll be interesting to see how those two candidates that do go on to the runoff um, try to try to garner those votes that were cast for alternate ideas in that first initial election. Let's talk about our voters here in Denver. Krista, what, 33 percent of registered voters actually put in a ballot? And this is at a time, the first time in 12 years, we'll have a new administration. I, I did think there would be more. Yeah, I, I did too. Um, municipal and, and off-year elections, though, do tend to bring out fewer people, and we we know that. Um, and I, you know, I wonder if it's just a question of of cynicism. Um, we do have a a political system that's getting kind of uglier and uglier, and I think that there is a a, seg a segment of the population that says, you know, I I don't want to be a part of this. I, I don't want to be bothered into into voting because my vote either doesn't matter or it's not going to change anything. We don't know what's going to happen. Huh. Eric, what are your thoughts from when you think about who voted and why, where they voted? Yeah, I mean, I think the final turnout here is going to be in the ballpark. Amber probably has the exact number. In the ballpark of 170,000, just over 170,000 voters. If you look four years ago, when Michael Hancock was running for his final term, uh, in the first before the runoff in the first election, there were 179,000 voters. And obviously, Denver has grown some, so there are, there's a larger voting base this time around than last time around. So the turnout is less than it even was four years ago when the seat was not open. I have a different take than Krista on this one. I think it was more a function, yeah, there's certainly cynicism and ugliness, and that goes without question. I think this was just the quantity of candidates on the ballot. I think voters were overwhelmed. I think people, sober-minded people, need to take a, lo a look at this fair election fund, the public financing. It might not necessarily be a bad idea. We can argue that another day. But what it has done is just contributed to so many candidates on the ballot that it drives down turnout. Uh, and in the name of increasing participation, I'm not sure we have really accomplished that purpose. Mm. Yeah, you might be right there. Yeah. Uh, you already mentioned, and there's been a lot of talk since Tuesday, about ranked choice voting. And we could have... Could we have you, do we need that when we had this many candidates here in Denver? And I heard there's already talk about doing this for the 2027 municipal election already. I'm a huge fan of ranked choice when you have a huge field. Um, and I think that it is important to give voters uh, more choice. That's really what they're what they get with a ranked choice type of environment. And I think with this election, we actually would have seen people turn their ballots in sooner and potentially even higher turnout because I did hear a lot of people say, "Oh, I like this person. I also like this person. I'm not sure what quite what to do." Um, so I think it actually would have had a, a much more positive uh, voting experience for all voters in Denver if we would have had that. Um, I'm also a fan of moving the municipal elections to November, and that would significantly increase turnout. It would save the city millions of dollars, uh, put it on the ballot with school board, and let's have conversations about local politics in, in the November odd year elections. Hmm, that's interesting, Patty. And let's have the, do, uh, the count go on for four more weeks. I mean, that's what, it was slow last November, and it's slow this yeah. time. I think the Fair Elections Fund has been fascinating. I mean, we didn't go over the $8 million, which surprised me. I thought we would run out of money just because there were so many candidates. It's going to come close, I think, by the time we pay for the city council runoffs, by the time we pay for the mayoral runoffs. They're eligible for one quarter of what they already received from the Fair Elections Fund. But I loved that we had so many candidates just because 
people in Denver want to talk, they want to share ideas, they want to hear other ideas, and some of those really unusual candidates, the ones you were pretty sure were not going to make it, ranked choice voting or no, gave really interesting perspectives. I was interested in hearing Terrence Roberts, definitely interested in hearing Ian, who's set, Ian Tafoya, who sat at this table. I thought they really added to the conversation and challenged some of the other candidates mm -hmm. to really explain why they thought what they did. So I think it's been a great election season and it's only gonna be more fun for the next two months. Yes. Yes, it will be. And then we have the school board in Denver. Right. Which will be very fun. Yes. Okay, now let's head over to the state capitol. Would fun be the use tour to describe what's going on at the state capitol right now? It's been a big session. Uh, and all session long, we've talked about how Democrats are in control of the state legislature. And we are seeing evidence of that reality. Eric, with the advance of, advancements of gun violence prevention bills and abortion access bills, we're seeing that the Democrats are in control and Republicans can't really make much of a dent. Democrats are having fun, to go back to your words. They're having plenty of fun. They're indulging um, every, one of, every item on their wish list, uh, every passion that they hold, everything that their constituencies is requesting and demanding of them. And the crazy thing is, in this state that has turned so blue so quickly in front of our eyes, there's really no pushback. I mean, there's, yeah, plenty of Republican rhetoric and a filibuster here and there. But if you're a Democratic strategist or a Democratic House leader or Senate leader or a governor staffer, there's really no reason to listen to all the pushback because you do not regard Republicans as a viable political force in this state at this particular moment. And the burden is on Republicans to prove that they can again be a viable force. And their track record of proving that case is uh, not a very strong one at the moment. So Democrats feel that they're bulletproof and that they can push these envelopes as far as they want to push these envelopes and that there's really no consequence to it. There are 30-something days left in the legislature. Amber, what are, what are you witnessing? What are you seeing? Uh, so two things that, that I've been watching, and, and one is um, actually it's, um, it's, it's not as exciting as a lot of the other issues, but uh, the county clerks have actually put forward a proposal for getting additional funding for election infrastructure. And elections have been underfunded in this state across the board, especially in small counties, large counties, uh, all have all experienced this, and they've put forth a, a proposal to modify how how the state reimburses counties for the cost of elections, which has been exponentially increasing with inflation and everything else. So, um, so I'm looking for that. I think there's a huge opportunity for a bipartisan uh, bill on that. Uh, I've, I understand Senator Bridges has been a part of a lot of those conversations uh, from the JBC perspective. So it'd be great to see that get done uh, to support our county clerks across the state. Um, and then the second big one that I've mentioned before is ranked choice voting for presidential primaries. Um, again, a, a large field of candidates. Presidential primaries are the perfect type of election model to utilize something like ranked choice voting, and it would be great to see that get done this year. Okay. All right. We will see if it gets in the next 30 days. Yes. Patty. Well, I think it'll be fascinating to see if we hear more from Leslie Harrod and Chris Hansen now that they are out of the mayoral race, and will they start talking more about some of their proposals and some of their you haven't heard as much from Leslie Harrod in the legislature as you usually do, especially with bill sponsorship. So we'll see if we hear more there. I also think we are going to hear so much about Jared Polis's proposed affordable housing, the bill that would give so many more rights to the state. You hear municipalities not just on the western slope, not just on the plains, but in the suburbs. Englewood just had to table some of its planned zoning changes. People are upset about the state seeming to take local power away in decisions on building, on zoning, and we're going to hear a lot more about it. Mm -hmm. You've been very vocal, Krista, on Twitter, too, with some of what's being passed in the legislature. Yeah, I guess I'm really frustrated. So I think about uh, abortion in this state. We allow abortion up until the birth of the baby, um, one of the most liberal states in that regard. But the Colorado voters consistently have opposed public funding for abortions. Um, a lot of the people I know who consider themselves pro-choice, uh, they may support uh, legal abortion, but they don't want to be part of that decision. They, they understand at some level that a, a child has died, and they... They may think it's necessary or okay at some level, but they don't, they don't want to be part of that. They don't want their money going to that. And what these bills would do is they would uh, force employers and employees, because we all pay premiums and part of our own health care through our employer plans, it would force employers to, uh, take, uh, to, to, to only 
contract with insurance companies that cover abortions up until birth. And I think about my health insurance plan that I get through the, the state exchange does not cover elective abortions. Um, if I were forced to subsidize that, I would have to lose my health insurance. So it's, it's very anti-choice in terms of people who are pro-life or people who are pro-choice but don't want to be part of that. It also, and in that sense, I think it, it violates the state constitution, which says no public funds uh, indirectly or directly can go to abortion. Other bills would uh, essentially uh, gag uh, pregnancy resource centers and not allow them to be able to do outreach. These are these uh, organizations that provide material health or health and, and wellness and different things for women facing pregnancy, uh, whether it's material goods or ultrasounds or so forth. So all along, I look at these bills and think, very anti-choice, um, and I, I hope if Governor Polis considers himself to be pro-choice, that in fact he will veto these bills. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see, because they're on their way to him. Also, former President Donald Trump is the first U.S. president ever to face criminal charges. He was indicted this week on 34 felony counts of falsification of business records regarding alleged illegal campaign contributions that were allegedly used for hush money when he ran for president in 2016. I am using the word allegedly a lot. Right? Just letting everyone know, allegedly, what the charges are. Amber, what impact could this have going into the GOP primary? I'm thinking, I'm hearing this could go into the new year. When primaries start? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, he raised a significant amount of money in the in when he announced actually that he expected to be indicted. Um, I've seen the T-shirts being sold with fake mug shots on them and everything else. So uh, clearly, financially, um, there there's a lot going on with with this in uh, that benefits his campaign because they have raised far more money in the last uh, week or so than they have before, um, which I, I think <laughs> that's a sad state of affairs, frankly, to to think about our politics in that way. Um, I think that it will depend on what happens in, in not only this case, but there are multiple cases, including one in Georgia, that um, I still think is one of the most important with regards to election integrity um, and the interference uh, that was attempted in the 2020 cycle. So we'll see what voters do with this information. I mean, they're, they're court cases, so they're going to take time. Um, and frankly, the other day, you know, I don't think we needed to see every national news network covering an airplane taking off that um, is frankly a very old airplane. I mean, I suppose it could have not gotten off the ground, which would have been a story in and of itself, but I would have much rather have seen the national networks paying attention to all of these local elections across the country that were happening that are very important to people's lives. You're right. Usually there is that kind of information around municipal elections across the country. There really wasn't. That's right. Well, and you look at Chicago, Wisconsin, there were amazing elections, not just here. Mm -hmm. um, the Georgia case is so interesting because of alleged uh, pressure put on the election officials there. It's much more interesting to talk about. It makes you feel less like you need to take a shower than when you're talking about Stormy Daniels. I mean, it's ironic that this first indictment is coming from that. But we have to remember just how important elections are, how important safe and fair elections are. And we're going to get another refresher course on that this month with the Dominion case coming up against Fox. And remember just how bad the rumors were in 2020. I'm happy to say we haven't heard a single rumor about a problem in Denver right, right. now, but nope. it's early. Yeah, let's hope. Krista. You know, I, I would love for this to damage his campaign. Um, I just think... <laughs> He paid, you know, he, he paid off a porn star in order to run for office to get people to vote for him in the primary and then fudge the paperwork. Does that rise to the level of a felony? I don't know. I've read some different, uh, different sides on that. Some people saying yes, it is. Some people saying no, it's not. Um, but what kills me, honestly, is when Republicans are like, oh, it's, it's no big deal. Everybody lies about sex. Isn't that what Democrats were saying back during the Clinton impeachment? Oh, it's just sex. It doesn't matter if people lie. Of course it matters. Of course it matters. We, you know, lying, whether it's perjury in the case of Clinton or lying on your paperwork, is still lying. And yeah, you can lie to your wife, which both of these men do. But if you're going to do it in a, a legal format, you're going to get in trouble. And just as Clinton, he got indicted, in a sense, by the House of Representatives. Then he got to put his case before the Senate. Same goes for Trump. He's been indicted. He now can go, he'll, he'll have a trial. Maybe he'll be found innocent. Maybe he won't. But the fact that he's being held accountable for his lies is an awesome thing. The fact that this may make Donald Trump more attractive in a Republican primary, what does that say about our politics and what does that say 
about the Republican Party these days. I think we all know what it says. I worry, I'm not an attorney, I worry that this is not the strongest case to bring against Donald Trump. I quite frankly worry that it's a weak case. I worry if it gets dismissed or if he gets acquitted, he becomes even more of a martyr. Per Amber, I think there are stronger cases. Uh, in Georgia, certainly, the federal case around documents and top secret uh, classifications. And then there's that minor, manner, minor matter of fomenting an insurrection on some date in early January a few years ago. I think all of those rise to a much higher level than this. In terms of the Republican attack about weaponizing the law against former presidents or against presidential candidates, that seems a little ironic coming from people who were chanting, lock her up, uh, about Hillary Clinton. Both parties have weaponized the law here. Shame on both of them. But the only thing worse than a country which holds former presidents accountable is a country that doesn't. And that's the choice we're making. OK. Uh, now let's get ready to end our show by going through our lightning round, going through some of the not so great and good things that happened this week. So, Patty, I'm going to start with you. What was something that was a disgrace for you this week or a disappointment? A disappointment that people do not say, go to downtown Denver. It's fine to go to downtown Denver now. They're great restaurants. They're great plays. I've been had an office downtown since the late 70s, and I can tell you there have been worse times than there are now. All you have to do is go outside on opening day and realize just how vibrant downtown can be. Yes, there's a homeless problem and a crime problem, but that's all over town. That's all over the metro area. That's CU over Health there. has the most cars stolen. That's one of the hot spots, the parking lot for CU Health. So don't think downtown is the big problem. Everybody needs to look at their own backyards, too. I hadn't heard that about the hospital. All right, Krista. You know, I, I got to beat the, the Trump drum a little bit more, only because I saw some polling data saying that he, like, uh, he was actually the favorite. Like, 52% of Republicans wanted him to be the nominee. And I thought, did you guys miss something? Like, the fact that he, like, fomented an insurrection and tried to steal an election. And then, of course, you've got the whole you know, Stormy Daniels thing. The whole thing is just so, it's so unseemly. I'm like, really, there are better candidates who have already announced. Let's look at some of these other people and put this guy, that orange face, in the rearview mirror. Eric. I'm going to go local and back to uh, the Denver election here. The fact that we are sitting here a few days after the election without knowing final results, shame on uh, and, and Amber can correct me if I, if I need correction, but shame on the vote counters here, but particularly shame on the city clerk's office. This should not be that difficult a process. It was not a long ballot. Many of the ballots were received, most of the ballots were received before Election Day and tabulated before Election Day. Some of this is because the whole office went on a dinner break eating barbecue during what should have been the vote counting period, it is hard to count ballots when they're smeared with barbecue sauce. Mm. <laughs> Krista, uh, before you go in, would you like to respond since you used to? Well, I was gonna. I was thinking I'd respond in the positive part uh, of the round. So, okay. so look, the most important thing for the clerk's office is to get it right and to get it accurate. Um, and and the fact of the matter is, we had a huge swath of Denver voters turn their ballots in at the last minute, as they've done in almost every election cycle. And I have tremendous respect and admire uh, the election officials, uh, a lot of my former colleagues that are all working very hard at the office right now to, to get this done. Um, I would encourage Denver voters to turn their ballots in sooner. I would encourage ranked choice voting that would help solve some of this. Um, and frankly, my disappointment um, is actually turnout. Um, you know, there, there are a ton of people behind the scenes that make this election happen, that spend a lot of energy and time and hours uh, processing ballots and serving voters. And, and you know, 35 percent, 36 percent turnout is very, uh, frankly, discouraging. And that's a downside for me this, this week. And, you know, I want to see that go up. I would agree with you. All right, let's end on something positive. Well, I have to bring an audiovisual aid. It's the best of Denver week. It's a, a big orgy of niceness, and it made it so difficult to actually put together <laughs> words any longer because we've written so many nice ones in here. But it's out on the streets. It's online. Yay. Yay. This is awesome. Um, 
I love it. The I, uh, I could almost like give away my uh, <laughs> give away my own you know um, word of the good and, okay. and praise this. But I I do want to say that I, I went to D.C. a couple of uh, like two weeks ago to see the cherry blossoms. There was a bazillion people there, and everybody was so happy and joyous. So we're always reading these gloom and doom stuff about how oh you know, the nation is you know coming apart and there's just so much anger. Everybody was like, hey, no, take my seat on the subway. Hey, look at that beautiful. Can you take my picture? I mean, it was really, it was really lovely. Oh, and great. so I think it's a reflection of really kind of who we are. Good. I want to pay tribute to a, a very longtime viewer of this program who also happens to be my mother, uh, Marion Sonderman, who is probably at the end of a very long life, very well lived uh, through quite the arc of history from a childhood in Holocaust Germany through being a proud contributing citizen of this state and this country in so many ways. So just a tribute there. Our love to your family. Um, my positive is the youth and the kids and the families in this city and all over the metro area and all over Colorado that are uh, starting spring sports, that are overcoming obstacles. Um, my, my own son was in children's hospital about a month, month, month or so ago, and I'm grateful to the folks at Children's Hospital for helping him. And I was also able to attend a, uh, an event where the avalanche were paired with some of the kids that have come from Children's Hospital and benefited from Children's Hospital uh, this past Sunday. And it's just incredible that we have uh, the sports teams we do that care about youth and then also the healthcare systems that we have that clearly um, support all of our families in Colorado. Yeah, you know, we talk about stuff that's not working, but you brought up something great. You, I mean, people coming downtown for opening weekend for the Rockies, there's a lot of good. So thanks everyone for sharing. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for watching, we appreciate it. It's been a big week in Colorado, so thank you for joining us on for this conversation. You can watch the show on pbs12.org anytime or on our YouTube channel, and you can also share it with a friend. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the return of warm weather, right? And the return of baseball in Colorado with this being opening weekend. I'm Kyle Dyer, I will see you next week here on PBS 12.